You are listening to the Slow Living Podcast, and I'm your host, Stephanie O'Day. What if I told you that you could truly have the life of your dreams, the life you've always wanted, one filled with abundance, joy, and a sense of purpose? It's absolutely possible, and I see it each and every day with my coaching clients. It all starts with learning how to slow down. You deserve to live the life you've always dreamt about. Let's get started. I am your host, Stephanie O'Day, and thank you for being here. I'm glad you are here because we're going to talk trauma, which is not a fun thing to talk about in any way, but a lot of stuff happened in this past week and the topic of trauma kept percolating and kept coming up in my day-to-day life to the point where I thought I couldn't escape it anymore. I want to talk to you. I want to teach you. I want to help heal you and then hopefully help you heal your children or help your children when it comes to kind of the traumatic everyday life experiences that they will come up with and and come across. And it's really interesting because I was writing down in order to prepare for this episode, the different traumas that I have experienced as I've gone through my life. I had a very normal suburban childhood. It was idyllic. It was wonderful. I have two parents. They're still married. Everything is fine. We lived in the suburbs. We had cats. We had a dog, goldfish, lots of wonderful things. So I am not in any way trying to paint a picture that I had any sort of traumatic childhood because I did not. What I had was everyday happenstance things that I, as a little kid, interpreted in weird ways, <laughs> in, in a normal child development ways that maybe grownups wouldn't understand. But to a kid, they were very, very real and seemed scary and seemed traumatic. And I internalized them. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And if you have divorce in the family, if you've had death, if you've had recent loss, if you've had upheaval, if you had a fire in your home, all of these things are very traumatic, especially for a child. And those are things that would be sort of quote unquote textbook traumatic experiences for a child that you would then help hopefully your young one through. If you as an adult have had these things happen and you haven't gone back and done a little bit of inner child work and sort of talked to yourself through them, I highly, highly recommend doing it. So I'm going to list out what I, as a 45-year-old, very normal, Caucasian, suburban, middle-class, middle-aged lady has dealt with, and it is fine. I'm not complaining. I am happy that all of the things happened in a way that they did, and I dealt with them. What I'm trying to express to you is that I did need to go back and do a little bit of inner child work. And I had a quote unquote normal childhood. So if you have had some things that you haven't fully addressed and dealt with, and you feel them bubbling up here and there, or if you feel sometimes like you're not making the forward progress that you want to in your life, it might be time to pause and go backwards and do some journaling and do some writing and do some inner child work. So the kind of pioneer who I really love her writing is Louise Hay, and she's written inner child um, books and healing the inner child. And I would absolutely get that book and read through it. And it is something that I do with my one-on-one coaching clients. We do sort of a life audit and we list them off. Okay. So (laughs) 
(laughs) The good thing is we are in a judgment-free zone. So for me as a kid, we live near the San Francisco airport and planes would fly over our house. And I once overheard a newscast story about a plane crash. And I was absolutely petrified. And I was young, maybe six, seven, eight years old. I was certain that a plane was going to crash on my house. And I thought perhaps maybe I could will it to not crash on our house if I stayed awake. So I would lie in bed and hear the planes and sort of pray that they would pass the house and not crash. And I did this for a very long time and became, I'm sure, insanely sleep deprived. But I also somehow knew it wasn't a rational thought and sharing it with my parents or grandparents wouldn't help um, because I think I just sort of knew they would brush it off like, eh, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Go back to sleep. But I was worried about it. It really bugged me. So I spent a lot of time worrying about that. Another thing that really sort of traumatized me as a kid was there was a bad guy in LA called the Night Stalker. And the Night Stalker, I must have overheard or seen a snippet of a Dateline special. And that petrified me. I was horrified that there was some bad guy breaking into homes and hurting people in the middle of the night. And so I was very, very worried that that was going to happen. And I spent an awful lot of time worried that that was going to happen. Another thing that I worried about um, probably came right out of Scooby-Doo and maybe the Brady Bunch, but I was petrified of quicksand. I thought any time I was on a hike or outside and there was any little bit of mud that it was actual quicksand and it was going to swallow me up and I wouldn't be able to breathe and I would suffocate and I never was the best swimmer. So the idea that you're supposed to, according to (laughs) Scooby-Doo, tread water in quicksand horrified me because I was certain that I would be swallowed up. So I did. I spent a lot of time being worried about that. I spent a lot of time being worried about being kidnapped. I remember after school, Donahue would be playing and for God only knows why reason Donahue spent a lot of time talking about kidnapping and and that the Adam Walsh dad was Adam Walsh the kid or the dad I don't know he was always on Donahue I was always worried that I was going to get kidnapped or one of my friends was going to get kidnapped or my baby brother was going to get kidnapped so I was very worried about that the 1989 San Francisco earthquake was a horrifying day for me. And I I vividly remember an awful lot of that day. And I remember being at my grandparents' house and it was fine. And my grandparents um, were there and they actually handled it very well. And my grandma talked to me through it and kept me very calm while it was happening. She said, we're having an earthquake. We, We moved from one door jam and then it lasted long enough that we ended up moving through the house to a more internal door jam. And then she said, okay, let's go find grandpa. And we found grandpa and he was in the garage and he was explaining how the car was bouncing up and down. And then grandpa was very smart. He opened the garage door manually because the power immediately went out and he turned off the gas. So everything was fine. What ended up being traumatic for me was all of the news after the fact and the news that the Bay Bridge had collapsed, that people died. So in the middle of the actual earthquake, since we were all fine, it wasn't super scary. I I was able to keep it together. It was, it was the news and the hearing of it that bothered me. And then in school the next day, the teachers, this, we were in middle school, the teachers thought it would be a good idea to not have any schoolwork that day. And they wheeled in televisions and we watched the news all day. So I kept seeing the same clips over and over again. So that really (laughs) was kind of traumatic. And I remember going to sleep at night with the radio on so I could hear the news and the people calling in, sharing their kind of earthquake survival stories. And so that was, was something difficult. The next day, the Challenger explosion, we watched that in school. That was the spaceship that exploded. Actually, my timeline might be off. I think Challenger was before 
the earthquake because we were in a different house. But anyway, so that happened. Princess Diana. Princess Diana dying was very just upsetting for me. I I, I loved Princess Diana. We, I, My mom and I stayed up late to watch the wedding. I thought she was beautiful. I thought she was wonderful. I didn't like it that she died. I stayed up all night watching the funeral and the procession and all of the things. And um, that haunted me for, for quite a while. Another thing that really affected me was Columbine. And then after Columbine, of course, Sandy Hook, just, just these things that happened. And, and I really was scared and worried. 9-11, all of us have our own versions of the 9-11 story and where we were and what we were doing. It's very similar to many people in older generations who, when they're together, start sharing where they were when they heard Kennedy was shot. So these sort of traumatic experiences sometimes can sort of freeze time in our brains and then also bring us together. And we certainly saw that after 9-11, the whole country sort of came together in this collective grief and recovering from trauma. And then now we're just kind of in the midst of never-ending COVID. So we're in, what, the third year of COVID. It's definitely the tail end. And I guess it's the second year. I don't know. It feels feels never-ending. And it's all going to be okay. But regardless of whether or not you have personally had it or your children have had it, We have lived collectively through a very traumatic period of time. And the only way to heal from trauma is to shine a light on it and look at it from all corners and work through it. And that is why it's so helpful when people have had a traumatic experience to talk about it and share their story over and over again, if, if necessary. Because when you don't share and you don't shine the light on the things, that's how it gets bigger and scarier and creepier in your head. And when it just kind of hangs out and creates more and more dark shadows, and that's when the problems occur. And that's when people turn to numbing out agencies. So like if you're an adult, drugs or alcohol, if you're a kid, it's maybe withdrawing or um, turning to video games or, or something to try and distract from working through it. Because I work in a school site and get to talk to kids all day long, it's really interesting to me now as an adult who has done an awful lot of training and sort of trauma in trauma informed the like child rearing. So, so I mean, it started when I was working at the homeless shelter and I had done all the work in social work and then was running the preschool centers. And then with my own kids, just really being aware and trying to talk them through what could be traumatic experiences and, and just trying to, to help them as much as possible. So for instance, unfortunately, we have had some medical stuff with our kids that we've needed to deal with and gone through. We've, we've spent time in hospitals. We've, um, needed to do some things. One of the, the first sort of traumatic parenting things that happened was I needed to call 911 because my middle daughter at the time she was having a febrile seizure. So I had just taken a CPR and first aid class. So I knew it was a febrile seizure. She had a fever earlier in the day. She didn't want to take the Tylenol. I didn't want to force her to take the Tylenol. I thought it was going to be okay. And she walked out and I think she was, oh, I don't know, 19 months, um, walked out into the living room and then had a seizure in my arms. So I happened to be a calm, cool, (laughs) and collected person under sort of emergency situations. It's just sort of who I am. I've unfortunately had to deal with a lot of quick decisioning, probably from, from working at that homeless shelter, that I just sort of spring into action. So I knew right away what it was. So I called Adam and Adam was outside and I said, you need to call 911. She's having a seizure. 
and he sort of froze and I'm continuing to hold the baby and keeping her still. Meanwhile, my five-year-old walked into the room and now she's seeing this. Maybe she wasn't five. I don't know. I'm getting all my dates, but just go with me here. Um, we, we will, we'll fact check <laughs> later. But so my older daughter is, is watching. And so I'm paying attention and trying to talk Adam through calling 911. And I'm very aware that her older sister is watching this. So Adam's now on the phone with 911. I then talk to my oldest, who's now sitting next to me. So I've got the baby in my lap and my oldest next to me. And I'm talking to her. I said, daddy's going to call the ambulance. The ambulance is going to be, is going to come. Your sister's going to be fine. We're going to go to the hospital. Everything's going to be fine. I don't want you to worry about it. The doctors are on the way. Police officers are on the way. Everybody's on the way. I now need to call grandma. Go get me the house phone. So she brings me the house phone. I call my mom and dad and, and they come over to then care for the oldest while we're, um, going to go to the hospital. So anyway, long story short, she's fine, obviously, and is like running around the house by the time the paramedics come. And we end up putting her in our own car, in her own car seat to go and get checked out. So why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because I had this sort of horrifying thought, but also a very clear thought that if God forbid, something happens to this little one in my lap, this is going to scar her older sister for life. And I don't want that to happen. I want to stay calm and I want to assure this other child that the adults are here. The adults are going to take care of the situation. And this is not something that you need to fix. This is not something that you need to worry about. And that is a really important thing for you to remember as you go through your parenting career. So we talked about COVID and I reminded you again that I'm a school site secretary and I work in elementary school and COVID is a real thing. So when COVID first sort of hit and it was scary and people were were terrified and didn't know what was going to happen, the, the first child at our school to get it after he was fully healed was hanging out with me in the office and um, helping me move some boxes. And so I was talking to him and I'm asking him, so how are you doing? I heard you had COVID. What did you think about that? And he said, I was really, really scared. And I said, yeah, it's very scary. I'm really sorry. I said, what were you thinking about? And he said, I thought I was going to die. Now, meanwhile, this is a nine-year-old little kid. So I am hugging him tightly and we're both wearing masks because this is still a thing. And I said, wow. I said, you know, did anyone tell you you weren't going to die? He said, no, nobody told me, but I had to wear a mask and I had to do this and I had to stay away from my sister. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is you may think some things are obvious, but they're not to a little kid. And you have to reassure the little kids in your life that you are going to take care of them no matter what, and you are not going to let anything bad happen to them. And if that didn't happen for you at a young age, then you need to take the time to do some sort of audit the way I just listed off for you, and then go back and talk to yourself as that little kid, hey, When your dog died, you were really sad. And I am so sorry that I wasn't there to to pay attention. So so talk to yourself as if you're the six-year-old or the seven-year-old or however it is. And then give yourself the words you are aching to hear from whomever it was in your life who should have and, and maybe couldn't or weren't able or didn't know that they were supposed to or didn't know how to help soothe you. So you go back and you soothe that inner child. And then now you, as a full-fledged adult, pay attention to how little things 
turn into great, big, huge, scary monster things in little kids' brains and let them talk through it. I remember (laughs) the first time I watched the movie Scream and it's probably the first and the only time that I watched the entire thing. So I am not a good horror movie person. I don't like it. I understand that about myself and it's not something I want to change. I don't want to work through it. I am not interested. I am a okay with not liking horror movies. So I vividly remember watching this horror movie with my friend, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. And her boyfriend at the time. And she fell asleep And now I'm awake in the dark with these two boys, one of them with Adam. So that's great. (laughs) Watching this movie in the dark at nighttime, like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. It was scary. I wasn't happy. I didn't want to watch this movie, but I felt like I was supposed to. And my friend was asleep. I didn't sleep for so long. And I was scared to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. So I remember calling Adam and waking him up because he was living in his parents' house too and talking to him being like, I have to go to the bathroom and I'm scared to walk down the hall. So just stay on the phone with me. So that is me as a much older teenager. I, I don't know. I was probably 18, 19 years old and scared to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night because of this horror movie, which Sounds silly, but then in my brain, it was so real. I was certain that that guy in the white mask was under my bed. Like, I just, I just was. So all of this, just to tell you, talk to your kids. What is going on in their brains? What are they thinking about? What are they scared about? And what can you, as the adult who loves them unconditionally and protects them no matter what, do to, to just wrap your arms around them and let them know that they are in this bubbled force field of safety and love and you're not going to let anything bad happen to them. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it's really funny. I was going to sign off, but I have one more silly kid story that I want to share with you. So um, we had this other little uh, friend in our, in our neighborhood and uh, I think he's... 10. So he was talking about how he wasn't feeling well because they went to Mexico for his uncle's wedding and the whole family got sick and they got diarrhea and vomiting. And it was really cute because kids don't like to say the word diarrhea. So he, he whispered it. He's, we had diarrhea. And I said, oh, you had fast poops. He's like, yeah. And I said, yeah, fast poops happen. That's Montezuma's revenge. And he then looked at me horrified and he said, revenge? What does that mean? Am I going to die? What is happening? And I said, oh, no, not in the slightest. And and I gave him a huge hug and said, I actually don't really know what Montezuma's revenge, where that stems from. We're going to do some Googling. We're going to figure this out. But no, this is just something to do with the drinking water and how your stomach bacteria is processing it. But you are going to be absolutely fine. But it's again, just to show you that this is a great kid, a stable kid. There's nothing wrong in any way. But he heard me as an adult say something off the cuff And he turned it around in a horrifying way in his brain. And so if I wasn't paying attention or if other people aren't paying attention, it's so easy for for little kids just to let something kind of twist them up in knots. Okay. I hope that was helpful. Again, any questions, any comments, shoot me an email, leave me a voicemail at stephanieoday.com forward slash podcast. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Tell me, what are you working on? Do you have inner child stuff that you need to kind of clean up and sort through? Is there anything in here that we talked about today that sort of rings true for you? Anything you want to kind of dive into with your own kids or your own family? Let me know. All right. As always, I think you are wonderful. Have a lovely day. Do you have a slow living story to share? Leave me a voicemail at stephanieoday.com forward slash podcast with any questions, comments, 
feedback, or testimonials, and I will be sure to include it in an upcoming episode. Also, if you found value in this episode, please share it with your family and friends and subscribe through your favorite podcast provider. The more you share, comment, and leave positive reviews, the more people we can reach and share the slow living lifestyle and messaging. Thank you, Slow Down Society, and have an absolutely wonderful day.